poor Homo neanderthalensis. From the moment their bones were first recognized in the mid-nineteenth century, they became a mirror into which Europe stared, and the reflection was shaped less by anatomy and more by fear, myth, pride, and a hunger to find a creature that would confirm our own specialness. It is astonishing how eager our species was to declare its closest relative stupid. But all the elaborate portraits, caricatures, and classroom thought experiments lead inevitably to a deeper question. What can actually be said about the Neanderthal brain, given that no Neanderthal brain has ever been found intact? We have never seen one. There is no prized specimen frozen in Siberian ice, no preserved corpse lying in permafrost. We are left with only the internal impressions, the traces left on the inner table of the skull. And in that absence, people have often filled the void with their own expectations. Several recent studies have confirmed that the Neanderthal frontal region showed no differences in shape or size compared to modern humans. This is because the forehead of the Neanderthal skull is sloping rather than upright because of their huge brow ridges but the internal structure of the skull is actually more upright than you would expect. A crucial point regarding Neanderthal brains is that cranial shape, including the famous sloped forehead and elongated vault, has very little to say about brain complexity. The brain fills the space available to it. Modern humans display enormous variation in skull shape, many with pronounced slopes, yet no anthropologist argues that these individuals are cognitively diminished. When Neanderthals and modern humans are compared internally, the space for higher-order association cortex appears remarkably similar. In other words, beneath differences in outer architecture lies a deep commonality. Even if Neanderthals lacked certain features of the modern cranial base, their endocasts show no meaningful lack of convolutional patterns and asymmetries. That is the signature of a complex distributed brain. Even the measurement of volume which might seem straightforward, historically involved techniques that now appear almost theatrical. Skulls were packed with mustard seed or millet, or filled with water and emptied into graduated cylinders. The brain cavity of the Neanderthal skull from Neander Valley holds 16,876 grains of water, whence its cubical contents may be estimated at 57.64 inches or 1,033.24 cubic centimeters. The measurement was repeated with dried millet, yielding 31 ounces, Prussian apothecary's weight. The image is vivid, scholars kneeling over ancient bones, pouring tiny seeds into the vault, then shaking them out to quantify the mind of a creature dead for 40,000 years. Crude, yes, but not useless. These experiments established what remains true. Neanderthals had large brains, overlapping completely with modern human ranges and slightly larger on average. With the development of computed tomography scanning, researchers no longer needed millet or water displacement. Volumes could be calculated digitally, permitting far more accurate reconstruction of cranial shape. Nevertheless, much of the classic reference literature still rests on older measurements, and these older values did a remarkable job capturing what mattered. In a sample spanning roughly 40,000 to 130,000 years ago, Neanderthal endocranial volumes ranged from about 1170 to 1740 cubic centimeters. A sample of 60 Stone Age Homo sapiens ranged from about 1090 to 1775 cubic centimeters. Of living people, one global survey placed the average at about 1349 cubic centimeters though the human range spans from roughly 900 to 2,100. These figures reveal something essential. Neanderthal brain size lies squarely among ours. There is no dramatic gulf in capacity. If anything, the average is slightly larger for Neanderthals. The skulls differ in shape. Neanderthals built theirs lengthwise, so that the vault extends like a football. Modern humans created a rounder, more globular shape, as if there were inward swelling at the back. This difference in external contour once tempted many scholars to believe that Neanderthal brains were disorganized or primitive. Their logic was simplistic. Sloping foreheads must mean small frontal lobes. Buns must mean wasted occipital tissue. But that logic collapses under scrutiny. The eyebrow ridges were too prominent, the noses too large, the teeth too big, the jaws too massive, and the chin apparently forgotten. 
the rear of the skull swelled into the famous bun. With these visual cues, it became safe to imagine they shambled like beasts. There were accusations that Neanderthals were pathological. Others called them imbeciles or evolutionary failures, in spite of the fact that they possessed brains somewhat larger than our own. They were cast as deviants who took their women from behind, as depicted in the movie Quest for Fire. Modern analysis suggests that Neanderthal endocasts do not reveal primitive patterns. Their endocasts do not show primitive features if size, convolutional patterns and asymmetries are considered together. The Neanderthal brain was fully human, with no essential differences in its organization compared to our own. The larger size was primarily metabolic and allometric, related to a larger amount of lean body mass than our own. The implication is that brain enlargement in Neanderthals had more to do with the body it served than with any dramatic leap in cognition. Cold, physical rigor and terrain demanded coordination, navigational skill, and a substantial neural budget for visual and motor control. Once this perspective is allowed, much more falls into place. For instance, recent proposals that Neanderthals devoted proportionally more neural tissue to vision and movement stand in agreement with the idea that their sensory and motor worlds were especially critical. One recent study compared orbits, noting that Neanderthals possessed larger eye sockets. This has been interpreted to mean that their eyes themselves were larger, and hence that the visual cortex may have been more extensive. If correct, this suggests that these ancient humans were particularly well equipped for life at high latitudes, where winters were long and sunlight was scarce. Whether orbital volume is truly a reliable indicator of visual cortex size is disputed, and some have pointed out that Neanderthals also had larger faces overall, which could influence orbital dimensions. The study acknowledged that this is definitely an avenue for further research, though the lead researcher maintained that a larger orbit still means a larger eye and therefore a larger visual cortex. Yet others have encouraged caution, because the brain is not so modular. One researcher noted that the idea that the size of a region, such as the visual cortex, can tell us how a brain worked is questionable. A century of neuroscience has shown that behavior arises from distributed networks rather than isolated compartments. Even large lesions can be accommodated, roots rerouted, functions relearned. Brains are plastic. A difference in volume in one territory does not tell a simple story. Still, these debates serve a purpose because they force us to ask what the Neanderthal brain was for. If the brain was large, largely because the body was large, then the Neanderthal environment was not simply a museum of tools. It was a land of physical struggle. Their social lives, while complex, may have operated on a scale where intimate, kin-driven relations mattered more than maintaining elaborate, far-flung networks. It is not hard to imagine small groups enduring bitter cold, reading tracks in the snow watching the sky for shifts in wind and cloud, learning by direct apprenticeship rather than through symbolic abstraction. In this scenario, a brain tuned for sensation, memory of place and coordination would be as magnificent as any devoted to elaborate ornamentation. Generations of anthropology students were required to imagine Neanderthals in business suits riding the subway, wondering how odd they would look among us. They would seem unusual, though not monstrous. They were not us, but they were close. However, interbreeding with Neanderthals means that we inherited some of their genes that even affect brain and skull shape in humans today, leading to a range of neurological problems. The Neanderthals buried their dead. There is evidence that they cared for the injured. They lived for hundreds of thousands of years across a vast territory stretching from Spain to Siberia. These accomplishments require memory, language, coordination, learning, and social cohesion. To believe that these people lacked symbolic behavior because little of it survived is to misunderstand the fragility of evidence. This leads back to the most persistent myth that brain size dictates intellectual ability. One researcher called this idea the tyranny of brain size. The temptation to equate cubic centimeters with genius is ancient, when 19th century anthropologists measured skulls to rank peoples, they found what they expected. When they confronted evidence that Neanderthals had brains as large as or larger than ours, they found reasons to explain it away. 
Neanderthals have been demonized for primitive endocranial features that are simply non-existent. If one insisted on the logic that bigger equals brighter, Neanderthals should be the brightest of all. It is valuable to recall that cold climates place strong demands on neural systems. Neanderthals simply participated in a broader rule. Bigger bodies and colder climates encourage larger brains. There has also been discussion of cerebellar proportions. A study published in 2018 attempted to reconstruct Neanderthal cerebella by taking magnetic resonance imaging scans from over 1,000 living humans and warping these images to fit digital endocasts of Neanderthal skulls. The results suggested that Neanderthals may have had a slightly smaller cerebellum than modern humans. Because the cerebellum participates in motor control, working memory, learning and language processing, some researchers have speculated that this difference might have influenced rates of cultural innovation or social cohesion. But that interpretation remains speculative. Cerebellar size varies widely among living humans, and we do not therefore assign higher or lower intelligence to individuals on that basis. Furthermore, the cerebellum is highly integrated with the rest of the brain, so differences in shape and proportion do not map cleanly onto differences in cognitive capacity. What the study does reveal is that Neanderthals had a brain that was organized somewhat differently in its internal balance, even while following the same overall plan as our own. The Neanderthal brain was fully human, with no essential differences in its organization compared to our own. Once one sees the Neanderthal brain as a legitimate human brain, adapted to its time and place, much of the speculative baggage falls away. Their mental world was not empty, only different in emphasis. Their lives demanded superb memory of terrain, weather patterns, prey movements, seasonal shifts, and social ties within small communities. This would require a network of cognition every bit as rich as that needed to survive in tropical forests or coastal estuaries. Neanderthals were highly competent, visuospatially, which fits well with the emerging evidence. Even so, such differences do not imply a hierarchy of worth. They are simply different solutions to the same problem, how to live. It is just as plausible that Neanderthals preferred stability to novelty, intimacy to cosmopolitanism, deep apprenticeship to restless exploration. To imagine that the only valid form of human culture is one filled with beads and statues is to reveal the narrowness of our view. Most cultures in the history of our species have left no surviving art, yet their people sang, dreamed, taught, and loved. In the end, the story of the Neanderthal brain is a lesson in humility. Their brains were large, complex, and fully human. Their skulls were shaped differently, but their internal structure was modern. The basic relationship between brain size and body mass was recognized before most of us were born. The link between brain size and lean body mass had been published in 1921. Smaller brain sizes are common in tropical regions, proving that climatic factors influence neural volume. All of this shows that brain size is governed by biological relationships among size, temperature and metabolism, and not by differences in behavior. In the quiet of that reflection lies the heart of the matter. The Neanderthal brain was not poor. It was only different in shape, and even then only slightly. Within it bore convolutions, asymmetries, and complexity equal in dignity to our own. To imagine them as dim is to cling to a prejudice. The sloped forehead and elongated skull conceal no deficit. They are variations on a theme, the human theme. That theme is resilient, flexible, and astonishing. It takes many forms. Ours is only one. Click on these other videos if you want to learn more than thank you for watching.